welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you are with us this morning. And I hope that God's going to use this worship service to strengthen your faith this morning and connect you with God. And even if you're in your home with someone else, that God would connect you and strengthen you to each other as well. So now let me invite us all to calm our hearts as we enter into God's presence. Let us worship God. Please join us for our first hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God is so loving and so tender that God is more ready to forgive than we even are to admit the ways that we have sinned against others and against him. So let us in that security come before him and just come clean and admit the ways that we have sinned even this past week. And so let's now confess our sins before God. And let's use the words you'll find printed on the screen. Let's confess our sin. Merciful Father, we are guilty before you. Forgive us the sins of our tongues for our deception and our dealings with others, for resentment, coldness, and impatience, for excuse-making, blame-shifting, boasting, criticizing, and gossiping. Forgive us for the sins of our eyes, for impurity in our glances and imagination 
for pining after more beauty, comfort, status, and wealth than you have given us. Forgive us the sins of our hearts, for hard-heartedness towards you and our neighbors, for pride, for self-absorption, self-pity, and above all, for rebelling against you and doubting your love. Holy Father, remove our envy and pride and melt our hearts. Transform us and let us, by your grace, live holy for your glory. Take away our mourning and give us music. Remove our sackcloth and give us your beauty. In Jesus' name we pray. Hear us now as we bring our personal confessions to you. Our dear Father in heaven, for all of our sins, we ask you to please forgive us in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the Apostle Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I declare to you in the name of Christ that you are forgiven. Hallelujah and amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the lectionary. Genesis chapter 45, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 5. Then Joseph could not control himself for all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Staying in Genesis, we're going to flip over to verse chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Our lectionary also includes a reading from the Psalm, Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. I so enjoy including in my sermons stories that I believe help connect God's Word to our lives. In light of our lectionary this week, I have drawn on a story from my very first sermon I ever gave back in 2012. I ask for your forgiveness if you have heard this before. But much like seeing a great movie for a second time, oftentimes you see or hear something that you missed from the first time through. May this occur for you today 
if you recall this story from the past. Louis Zamperini, prisoner of war. It was late morning on the last day of September 1944. Louis Zamperini and a handful of other Okinawa veterans stood by the front gate of the Omari POW camp, which sat on an artificial island in Tokyo Bay. The island was nothing more than a sandy spot connected to a shore by a tenuous thread of bamboo slats. Across the water set the bright bustle of Tokyo, still virtually untouched by the war. Other than patches of early snow scattered over the ground like hopscotch squares, every inch of the camp was an ashen, otherworldly gray, reminding one POW of the moon. There were no birds anywhere. They were standing before a small office where they had been told to wait. In front of them, standing beside the building, was a Japanese corporal. He was leering at them. He was a beautifully crafted man, a few years short of 30. His face was handsome with full lips that turned up slightly at the edges, giving his mouth a faintly cruel expression. Beneath his smartly tailored uniform, his body was perfectly balanced his torso radiating power, his form trim, a sword angled elegantly off of his hip, and circling his waist was a webbed belt with an enormous metal buckle. The only incongruities on this striking corporal were his hands, huge, brutish animal things that one man would liken to paws. Louis and the other prisoners stood at attention, arms stiff, hands flat at their sides. The corporal continued to stare, but said nothing. Near him stood another man who wore a second lieutenant's insignia, yet hovered about the lower ranking corporal with eager servility. Five. Perhaps 10 minutes passed, and the corporal never moved. Then abruptly, he swept toward the prisoners, the second lieutenant scurrying behind. He walked with his chin high and his chest puffed out, his gestures exaggerated and imperious. He began to inspect the men with an air of possession, looking them over Louis thought as if he were God himself. Down the line, the corporal strode, pausing before each man, raking his eyes and barking, name. When he reached Louis, he stopped. Louis gave his name. The corporal's eyes narrowed. Decades after the war, Men who had looked into those eyes elicited a twist in the gut, a prickle at the back of the neck. Louis dropped his eyes. There was a rush in the air, the corporal's arm swinging, then a fist thudding into Louis's head. Louis staggered. Why no look me in the eye, the corporal shouted. The other men in line went rigid. Louis steadied himself. He held his face taut as he raised his eyes to the corporal's face. Again came the whirling arm, the jarring blow into his skull, his stumbling legs trying to hold him upright. You no look me in the eye. This man, thought the others, is a psychopath. His name was Mushito Wantabe the bird. The story I just shared with you is a true story. And in the end of our sermon today, I want to share with you a letter 
that Louis wrote to the bird. It is a letter of forgiveness. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to ask you to think, how in the world could we ever muster the strength to forgive someone who has treated us so horribly? Well, only with God's help is our sermon title today. And I think it also might be the answer to our question just raised. In our Old Testament reading today, we read about Joseph and his forgiveness of his brothers. But I think it's worth asking again, how in the world could Joseph forgive his brothers? Well, only with God's help. As we prepare to discuss our reading today, I'd like to back us up one chapter prior to his enca this encounter with his brothers. Joseph lays a test for his brothers. Joseph tells his stewards to fill his, the men's sack with food, for they're going on a journey. He tells the steward, put as much as you can in each man's sack, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, Benjamin. You see, these brothers had left their father Jacob and traveled to Egypt due to a famine. A famine that would last seven years. These brothers did not want to take the youngest brother with them as their father was old and he loved the youngest very much. These same brothers also realized that they had deceived their father, telling him that Joseph was dead, when in fact they had rid themselves of Joseph. Now our scene takes place when the test is put on the brothers. Joseph tells his steward to follow the men and overtake them. And when this is done, they are caught. And the steward accuses them of stealing from his master. The brothers deny this adamantly. In fact, chapter 44, verse 9 goes like this. The brothers are saying, If any of us are found to have the cup, he must die. And the rest of us will become slaves of the Lord. You see, the brothers knew in their heart that they had not stolen. So thus they were prepared to wager anything. But the test, oh, the test. The master's cup, Joseph's silver cup, is found in the bag of, you guessed it, the youngest. The brothers, it says, tore their clothes and every brother returned to Egypt. You see, Joseph was seeing if these brothers' hearts had changed. Judah begs Joseph, even offers himself for servitude if he will only let the youngest be free. Judah has indeed changed in Joseph's eyes. And again, we can ask ourselves, how could this change ever happen only with God's help. Our reading in chapter 45 brings light to this story. In verse 1, Joseph is so overtaken with emotion. In fact, it says he can't control himself and he cries. He makes everyone but the brothers leave. In verse 3, and Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father alive? But his brothers cannot answer him, for they are dismayed at his presence. Joseph begs the brothers to come near. In fact, he says, come near, please. He says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And in verse 5, he tells them, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves for selling me here. 
For God sent me before you to preserve life. Friends, can you truly picture this story in your mind? Joseph, abandoned, forgotten, sold by his brothers, is not only forgiving them, but he is telling them that God planned this so he could save their lives. Listen to these words again from Genesis 50, 20. As for you, brothers, you meant this evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Just a little side note. When we think that the Old Testament is truly also about Jesus, then doesn't this verse fit just perfectly to Christ's crucifixion? What the men in Jesus' life meant for evil, God meant it for good. So that many, all of us, could be kept alive and our alive is eternally forever. How ironic. Jesus does for us the exact same thing that Joseph does for his brothers. But how could this be done? Only with God's help. How in the world could Joseph be so forgiving? Only with God's help. And the vision to see that it was planned by God in advance. I liked what Rusty said a couple of weeks ago in his sermon. If you'll recall, he said, God wants us to win. When he puts difficult things in our lives, it's only for the benefit of our winning. Ironically, our lectionary reading today from Psalm 133 is titled in my Bible as, When Brothers Dwell in Unity. Verse 1 of Psalm says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live in unity. Joseph chose to make this happen with his brothers. And our psalm today describes a situation in which the land is fruitful enough for brothers to live nearby each other. The brothers dwelling in unity would be the Israelite pilgrims gathered in Jerusalem, abiding in peace with one another. The ideal Israel is a community of true brotherhood, where the members practice mutual concern for one another. If this is achieved, it would indeed be good and pleasant. Let me show you someone else who wants it to happen also. Follow with me, if you have your Bibles near, to the Gospel of John. We're going to turn to chapter 17 and hear these words from our Savior in verses 20 through 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Jesus' concern in these verses is for his followers' unity and love. The vision of a unified people of God, once unified believers in God, they will be able to bear witness to the true identity 
of Jesus. But how in the world in this time of separation, in this time of COVID-19, in this time of unrest in our nation, can we be unified? Well, the sermon title says, only with God's help. My dear friends at Grace, I told you earlier that I wanted to share a letter with you that Louis Zamperini wrote to the bird. Well, here it is. To Mushito want to be. As a result of my prisoner of war experience under your unwarranted and unreasonable punishment, my post-war life became a nightmare. It was not so much due to the pain and suffering as it was to the tension and stress and humiliation that caused me to hate you with a vengeance. Under your discipline, my rights, not only as a POW, but also as a human being, were stripped from me. It was a struggle to maintain dignity and hope to love life until the war's end. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble. But thanks to a confrontation with God through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Christ. Love replaced the hate I had for you. Christ said, forgive your enemies and pray for them. As you probably know, I returned to Japan in 1952 and was graciously allowed to address all the Japanese war criminals at Sugamo Prison. I asked about you and was told you probably committed harakari, which I said was sad to hear. At that moment, like others, I forgave you and now would hope that you would also become a Christian. Signed. Louis Zamperini. Grace Church, how in the world could Louis Zamperini forgive the bird? How in the world could a betrayed, forgotten, abandoned, sold brother forgive his brothers? How could the Son of God leave heaven and communion with his Father for lives that he knows will abandon him, threaten him, crucify him. How can we, as a community of believers, live in such unity that others could say, as the psalmist said in today's reading, that it is good and pleasant? Well, dear friends, I must say, only with God's help can this be done. And remember, God wants us to win. And you know what? When we give our lives completely to Him, we win more than we can dare even dream possible. But only with God's help can we make this happen? Amen. Let us pray together. Pray with me if you would. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you that we are so secure in your care for us, even in such a painful time as this is right now for us, Lord, even in the world, uh, how things how things are right now with the COVID and with chaos, Lord, we thank you, Father, that nevertheless we are in your care and that you're with us and that you're, you're, you've promised that you're in control of all of life and that uh, you've overcome the world. And so we trust you, Lord, and we thank you that that's true. Help us to believe that. Lord, even as we are distanced, uh, separated, social distancing from each other, Lord, it just has been so difficult, Lord, this uh, 
COVID struggle has drained us, Lord, so much and in so many ways. And we need you, Father. We need your provision of yourself in our midst and in our hearts. And so we pray, Lord, that you keep strengthening us and we pray for a vaccine and a return, Lord, back to connecting with each other as we so desperately need. Lord, we think of uh, our teachers and students as they, uh, as they are about to move back into the academic uh, world. And, and Father, we pray for the struggles there. We know that there will be more load on them because of uh, the challenges. And so we pray for teachers and students, Father, that you would be with them and help them, Lord, to continue to, to be successful, to glorify you in the ways that you've called all of them to. Lord, we, we pray as a church as well. Father, we, we long to get back together. We, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to put a team, a COVID team of regathering together, that we would be able to discern uh, when and how to return, Lord. We, we long for the Lord's Supper. We long for hugs. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us there. Lord, we pray for uh, those who are married in our midst. We pray for families. Lord, that you would provide strength to keep serving and enjoying and loving each other. Uh, we pray for all of our relationships in our family, for healing and for strength, even as it's tied, uh, tried and tested uh, because of the COVID challenges there in the home and the family as well. Lord, we pray for those in our midst who have had recent medical procedures we pray for your healing. We thank you for the mercy of modern medicine. And we thank you for all those in our church right now that uh, are healing. We do pray for healing for all, everyone. Lord, we, uh, we pray for the ministry and the studies that we've uh, had virtually. And then even as we look to the fall, uh, if we have to continue with virtual resources, that you would you'd help us, Lord, to connect with you and your word and even each other through those means as well. Lord, there are so many things that we need to pray about and we just trust you and we look to you to strengthen us as we press on to live lives that glorify you in all that we say and do and think. And so Lord, we thank you, Jesus, and pray now the prayer that you taught us to say, praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us in singing Jesus is Lord of all.
friends, thank you so much for being a part of our service today. So what did we learn? We learned that with God's help, we can forgive brothers who abandon us. We can see how Christ forgives us for abandoning him. And we can learn how we can love each other in unity and grow together so that others can see the love of Christ in our hearts. And we can do all of that with God's help. And much more, I must add. I want to close today. I've been doing a study this summer of the Old Testament. And I came across Solomon's benediction. And I decided that I would share it at my next time to preach. So it comes from 1 Kings chapter 8, beginning in verse 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he has promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by, his, by Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Let these words of mine, which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, and may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires that all of the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God there is no other let your heart therefore be wholly true to the Lord our God walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments unto this day may God bless you until we gather together again amen